Hi guys and welcome back to the channel. I hope that everybody is doing well today. If you are new here, then hi, my name is Brittany and I'm a nurse practitioner and I'm also the creator of the Brittany Holzbeck NP Review. It's the most comprehensive, affordable, and accredited nurse practitioner boards review on the market. If you are interested in checking it out, I will have the link in the description box below. All of my courses are available at www.thenewnp.com. So in today's video, this is actually an excerpt taken from my pharmacology crash course. It's a three hour lecture. It is sold individually and it's also part of the complete boards review. So if you're just interested in the complete pharmacology crash course, you can purchase it on its own. But if you are going to purchase one of my boards reviews, don't worry, it's included in that as well. If you do not want to purchase anything, that's great because I have a like 20 minute lecture here that you get for free. And so I hope that you enjoy it. I'll go over some really foundational stuff that everybody needs to know in regards to pharmacology. We'll talk about non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and a bit about antibiotics. Again, if you're interested in the complete lecture, make sure you visit www.thenewnp.com. But all right, guys, let's get into the lecture. But before we do, if you could just do me one quick favor, go ahead and like the video and subscribe to the channel. It's a free way to help me out and I really do appreciate it. All right, so let's get into today's content. Hello and welcome to the pharmacology crash course. So this lecture is going to focus solely on pharmacology. It's not going to include anything regarding diagnosis as you receive that more in-depth review in the original course. This is strictly going to focus on pharmacology. So I will go over some foundational content like pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and then bioavailability. I will also discuss medication names, medication selection, interactions between medications, contraindications, side effects, safety concerns, and so on and so forth. To reiterate, this is solely about pharmacology. The goal is to focus on key points that you need to know for your board's exam and of course always as you enter practice. So first I just want to go over a couple of definitions that are important for you to be familiar with. So pharmacokinetics. This is the study of how drugs move throughout the body or what the body does to the medication. A drug's pharmacokinetics includes absorption absorption, distribution, metabolism, and then elimination. Pharmacodynamics, this is the study of what a drug does to the body. It refers to an individual's body's therapeutic response to a medication, which is generally determined by the drug's affinity and activity at its site of action, which oftentimes is going to be a receptor. The term bioavailability is the ability of a drug to be absorbed and used by the body. And then finally, a drug's half-life. This refers to the time it takes for the amount of a drug's active substance in the body to reduce by half. And so that's just some terminology that you want to be familiar with. And then on this next slide here, I'm just going to go over a couple of important concepts before we really dive into the various medications and drug classes. All right, so like I said, there's a couple of concepts that I want to go over before we head into the actual meds themselves. So first, I want to talk about what the first pass effect is. So the first pass effect is a pharmacological phenomenon in which a drug undergoes metabolism at a specific location within the body, thereby reducing the availability of the drug to travel then to distant sites. So this can occur at various sites within the body, but it is largely due to the liver because the liver itself is responsible for the selective uptake, concentration, metabolism, and excretion of the majority of drugs and toxins that are introduced into the body. So there is the cytochrome P450 system. I feel like we've probably all heard of this, but to know what it actually does is very helpful. So this system, it is a group of enzymes that metabolizes drugs, and though it is found within most tissues of the body, it is largely concentrated in that liver. It's important to know that some medications are considered strong inhibitors of the cytochrome P450 system, and then others are considered strong inducers. So examples of strong inhibitors include many medications that end with that IR. For example, the nermotrelvir ritonavir. I'm sure this is a medication that many of us are familiar with because it's sold under the trade name Paxlovid and it's used for the treatment of COVID-19. But there are lots of other medication examples listed here. Also, multiple azole drugs are considered to be strong 
inhibitors of that CP450 system. So for example, ketoconazole. Another medication on this list that we're all familiar with is clindamycin, which is a macrolide antibiotic. It's often used as a backup option when patients have allergies to other antibiotics. And so what's the concern? The concern is that if a medication is a strong inhibitor of the cytochrome P450 system, think about it. If it's largely responsible for metabolizing medications, what might happen if that system is in inhibited or no longer working at its top capacity. Well, we could potentially see a buildup of other medications within the body, which can lead to either unwanted drug interactions and increased side effects of medications that are also metabolized by that same pathway. And so as healthcare professionals, we need to be cognizant of this and need to be vigilant in monitoring our patients when they're on these medications. For example, monitoring for signs of drug toxicity or potentially reduced efficacy of other medications that the patient is taking, that is a concern as well. And then equally as important is understanding what it means if a drug is a strong inducer of the cytochrome P450 system. This means that said medication now speeds up the metabolism of other drugs that are also processed by these same enzymes. And this can potentially lower their effectiveness because they are being broken down faster than than intended. And this can also lead to potential drug interactions. If it's taken with other medications that again rely on that cytochrome P450 system for metabolism. And so you can see on this slide I do include a list of strong inducers as well as the strong inhibitors. I did want to point out that under the list of moderate inhibitors and moderate inducers are a couple of important agents that you should be familiar with and I feel like we've all heard heard of this, but maybe didn't quite understand why. And so grapefruit juice, this is considered to be a moderate inhibitor. And St. John's wort is considered to be a moderate inducer. Hence why we are always asking and concerned about our patients and their intake of these. Because if they are also taking medications that use the CP450 system for metabolism, there can be some complications. In addition to drug metabolism, drug elimination is an important process to be familiar with, and it is the kidneys that are the main organs involved in drug excretion. And so the glomerular filtration is a large component of that elimination process, and it works to filter waste and excess fluid from the blood into the urine. So the glomerular barrier, or the filtration membrane, this restricts passage of plasma proteins such as albumin, red blood cells, and other large blood constituents. And therefore, drugs that are bound to these elements are not going to be effectively filtered. Many drugs bind to albumin, for example, including barbiturates, benzodiazepines, penicillin, valproate, warfarin, NSAIDs, like I said, many drugs. And so because of this, these drugs can tend to have a longer duration of action. However, coupled with aging, renal drug excretion decreases and the glomerular filtration rate decreases by about 1% every year, which does lead to significantly decreased drug elimination in the elderly population. It's actually estimated that by 80 years of age, drug clearance is typically reduced to half of what it was at the age of 30 years old. Also, patients who are critically ill or those with chronic kidney disease also are going to experience a reduction in drug excretion as well. All right, so now that we got all of that out of the way, I want to move on and focus on some specific drug classes that are absolutely important to have an understanding of, starting with the NSAIDs, also known as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So there are more than 20 different agents available within this drug class, and they are widely used for their analgesic, anti-inflammatory, and then antipyretic 
properties. The primary effect of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs is to inhibit cyclooxygenase, and this is an enzyme that produces prostaglandins, and it is key in the inflammatory process. Prostaglandins are hormone-like substances that affect several bodily functions, including both inflammation and pain. So there are two variants of the cyclooxygenase, and they are referred to as COX-1 and COX-2. So COX-1 is described as the, quote, housekeeping enzyme because it helps to regulate normal cellular functions such as vascular homeostasis, platelet aggregation, and kidney function. And then COX-2 is considered to be a highly regulated enzyme. It's expressed in the brain, kidney, bone. Also, it's likely believed to be expressed in the female reproductive system as well. And COX-2's expression is increased during states of inflammation. Another distinguishing characteristic of COX-2 is that its expression is inhibited by glucocorticoids, which likely contributes to that significant anti-inflammatory properties of glucocorticoids. Another important point with this class is that aspirin, this inhibits platelet aggregation associated with COX-1 in an irreversible manner. And so it has proven benefits in reducing the risk of secondary thrombotic cardiovascular events. And though this drug class is so incredibly useful and widely used, being that many of which are available over the counter, it does not come without its own set of risks. So first, I want to talk about drug interactions, as there are many medications that do interact with NSAIDs. So remember, like we just talked about, certain medications are highly protein bound, and how these medications then are not as effectively filtered. So like I I said NSAIDs are one of those drugs that are highly bound all of them besides aspirin. And so because of this, other medications that are also highly bound to proteins are going to be at an increased risk of having an increased biologic effect if you're taking it along with NSAIDs. So for example, NSAIDs should not be taken with phenytoin, which may be used in the treatment of epilepsy. Also warfarin. This is another medication that should not be taken with NSAIDs, as the two together can actually increase the person's INR or bleeding time unsafely. Other drug interactions to avoid with NSAIDs include methotrexate. This is used for various different cancer treatments. When used with NSAIDs, this decreases the renal excretion of the methotrexate. This just results in higher drug levels of that medication. Um, NSAIDs are known to reduce the efficacy of ACE inhibitors due to multiple factors, one of which is that it blocks the vasodilator and natriuretic prostaglandin, and then also the risk of peptic ulcer disease increases significantly when glucocorticoids are used in combination with NSAIDs. Also, NSAIDs, they need to be restricted in various populations. So for example, anyone that has active peptic ulcer disease or a history of GI disease or if they are at risk for GI disease, for example, those that are 60 years and older are considered to be at risk for GI disease. And so it's recommended to either restrict the use or use a gastroprotective agent such as a proton pump inhibitor while using the NSAID, like a meprazole while taking the NSAID. Or celecoxib, this does not inhibit COX-1. And so it is said to be a better alternative if an NSAID is needed in this population. Also, patients with cardiovascular disease or those that are at an increased risk for cardiovascular disease should avoid the use of both NSAIDs, including non-selective NSAIDs and COXIBs. And patients that have chronic kidney disease, or if they're at risk for chronic kidney disease, they also should avoid NSAIDs as well. One of the main reasons for this is because NSAIDs can lead to kidney injury due to renal vasoconstriction that occurs with NSAID use. And so, like I said, Though they are readily available and so commonly used, they do not come without risk. And so with every medication, we're always weighing risk and benefit. And we need to remember that these are not harmless medications and some patients really should be avoiding NSAID use. All right, leaving NSAIDs, let's dive into antibiotics. So the decision on how to properly treat a specific bacterial infection 
is often based on the result of a gram stain and culture. And so it's going to be of the utmost importance that we know how to interpret these. So the gram stain, it's used to differentiate between various types of bacteria. And in general, it categorizes bacteria into either gram negative or gram positive bacteria. And so the way that the process works in very brief, simple terms is that a violet stain is added to the specimen. And then seconds later, decolorization is done using either acetone or alcohol. And then after that, a counter stain with safranin or red dye is added to the specimen. So gram positive bacteria will retain the violet and so they will appear purple with gram staining. And then gram negative bacteria do not retain the violet, but they do take up that safranin counter stain, and so they appear pink. Some organisms are considered gram variable, meaning that they can stain either negative or positive. An example of this would be Gardnerella vaginalis, which we do see with the bacterial vaginosis. And then some bacteria can't be visualized by gram stain. So one example is the mycoplasma species because this lacks a cell wall. Also chlamydia and mycobacterium species because their cell wall structure does not retain gram stain regions. The most common examples of gram positive bacteria include Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, and then Enterococcus. And then I have some other less common examples on the screen. And then there are lots of gram-negative bacteria, plenty of examples you can read on the screen here as well. Some of them include Pseudomonas, Haemophilus, S you know, I'm not even going to try. Maraxella cateralis, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing them correctly, but there is a lot of gram negative bacteria. But those big ones that we hear all the time, Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, Enterococcus, those are all gram positive. All right, so let's talk about some specific antibiotics now, starting with beta-lactam antibiotics. And this includes penicillins and cephalosporins. And they are referred to as beta-lactam antibiotics because both of these drug classes have a beta-lactam ring in their chemical makeup. So clearly they are very useful antibiotics as these are some of the most widely prescribed due to their vast array of different clinical indications. Unfortunately though, we are seeing resistance to beta-lactams. This is becoming a growing concern. One of the big contributors to this is the production of beta-lactamase. And so beta-lactamase, it's an enzyme that can actually break down that beta-lactam ring. One tool that we do have against beta-lactamase is clavulanic acid. And this actually works to protect that beta-lactam ring and preventing it from being broken down. And you should be familiar with clavulanic acid because we add it to amoxicillin. This is also known as augmentin, which we know it's often used for patients that are experiencing either treatment failure with plain amoxicillin or if they've had recent antibiotic use. And so it's a, it's a medication of choice because it works more effectively against some of that resistant bacteria, specifically the bacteria that can produce the enzyme that breaks down that beta-lactam ring. All right, well, hopefully you enjoyed that lecture. Hopefully you learned a little bit of something. Let me know if you have any questions in the comment box below. Otherwise, as always, don't forget to learn something new every day, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye, guys.